What prevents a gyroscope from falling over? It almost seems like it's defying gravity. You may have seen this gyroscopic procession before, but the physics going on is interesting enough that one of the teachers I TA'd for during my physics degree told me that describing this motion was the interview question that helped get him hired at the university. We'll start out with a conceptual explanation, and then I'll break down the physics behind it. Another aspect of the motion which may seem strange at first is the fact that the direction of precession actually depends on which way the gyroscope wheel is spinning. Let's start with the intuitive approach. Let's say we were to freeze the gyro, how would it fall? Well, gravity is going to pull it down, but it also has an upward force on the other side where its stand is, and that's called the normal force. By the way, these are vectors, elements with magnitude and direction, we can represent them with these arrows. So if it were just sitting here like this, the top and bottom of the gyro wheel would have this type of motion. The top would angle down and the bottom would angle up. If the gyro wheel is spinning, however, its rotation is added to this motion and some of the vector components will actually cancel. The spinning rotates the stationary tilt by 90 degrees, so it no longer tilts downward. Instead, it tilts to the side, exactly how we see the gyroscopic precession. It's the same idea with a thruster on a satellite or something in orbit. You want to use your thruster 90 degrees before the part of the orbit that you would want to elevate uh, because of this combination of vectors. There's a really great Vsauce video and plenty of others that continue the conceptual aspects of this type of motion. And I'll leave links to some of those down in the description. But for this video, I want to show you some more of the nuts and bolts in a physicist's toolkit when describing this. I just want to mention real quick, this stuff is tough. And if you grasp any of it, you should really be proud of yourself. Here we go. Some of you have probably seen Newton's second law before. If you have, it was most likely written like this. F equals M A. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. So that's very good. That's not how Newton would have written it though, uh, at least not at first. So he would have actually involved a little bit of calculus here and written it like this. Now, what this is saying is force is equal to change in momentum with respect to time. So that is a derivative of momentum right there, a time derivative. Uh, so if you're afraid of calculus, don't worry, just say change in momentum over change in time. Um, and that actually works much better for a lot of circumstances. Um, and it makes pretty good sense when you think about it. So, for example, let's say we have the penguin right here, and you've got no momentum at the moment, uh, zero momentum, but he's going to have some force applied to him from the Batmobile, changing his momentum, right? And one case that uh, this works and this actually doesn't is the rocket equation. So, let's say we have a rocket ship. Now, the rocket ship is burning fuel, right, out of its thrusters. That actually changes the mass, as it loses fuel, it changes the mass of the rocket. So, in that case, this guy actually doesn't work. So, uh, that's where this really comes in handy. Now, to think more about things in rotation, this is great for x, y, z, um, but if we're thinking polar coordinates, something rotating, we can look at torque, which is the rotational analog of force there. So for torque, let's use tau for torque. And there's something kind of like this. So we've got I alpha 
I know I'm throwing a lot of symbols at you, but just bear with me. So I here is the moment of inertia, which is the rotational analog of mass right there. And then alpha is the angular acceleration. So that matches up with the A there. So that's a nice little parallel. Um, but there's also something for this. So we can write, rather than translational momentum, we can have angular momentum written as L there. And the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time. So change in angular momentum over change in time is the torque. Uh, so there's one last way that I'm going to go ahead and write this. Um, well, kind of two last ways, but um, we can also think of it with the actual radius or lever arm to uh, whatever the torque is being applied to and then the force on it. So that's a way to get from this translational to rotational um, draw between the two. So for that, we're going to use uh, this nice green color for the lever arm. And we are going to do a fancy kind of multiplication, uh, which is great for vectors because it allows us to also know the direction of our result here. And so that's called the cross product. We're going to take the lever arm cross product with force. And so that's a way we can take the force here and wrap it up into the rotational motion. So that's great. Let's say we wanted to find just a number though. What if we don't care about the direction, the arrow, right? For those vectors. Well, for magnitude, if we just want a number, no direction, take the magnitude of the torque. That is going to be equal to the magnitude of the lever arm. We're just using these lines to say just a number, no more direction, no more vectors here. And then the magnitude of force. There we go. But there's one last little thing we need, which is actually the sign of the angle between these two. One of the nicest examples for thinking about torque is a door. We use torque so many times a day and may not think about it a whole lot. For a door, the lever arm is the distance between the hinges and wherever you decide to push on the door, applying some force to it. Most of the time we apply that force right where the handle is and we push perpendicular to the door. That is with very good reason. Think about that equation for torque. For the magnitude to be maximized, we want the angle between R and F to be 90 degrees. So that way the sine of 90 is equal to 1 and we get the maximum torque for the force that we're applying. If we were to push, say, parallel to the door, uh, like we're showing here, um, you'd be trying to push it towards the hinges and the angle between R and F is 180 degrees, while the sine of 180 is zero. So no matter how large of a force you apply that direction, the torque is always zero. It's also helpful that we push on the door with a maximum R, maximum lever arm, and that will give us more torque once again. Try pushing on a door in the middle of it or closer to the hinges. It will take a lot more force to actually get it to open. This is where leverage comes from. Not financial leverage, but more Pirates of the Caribbean leverage. Uh, so when you use a longer lever arm like that, you don't have to apply as much force to get more torque. So we know when maximum torque occurs, but what direction is the torque when that happens? Well, interestingly, it's actually up. 
find the direction of torque, or any other cross product for that matter, we use the right hand rule. Position your right hand like this. Your pointer finger will be the first vector, your middle finger is the second vector, and if they are 90 degrees from one another, then your thumb will point in the direction of the cross product. When I first learned this, I thought it was really weird, uh, but this is the best way for the math to work out. Let's think of a door opening. So if a door is swinging open, both R and F are changing directions. But defining a cross product like this means the torque is always in the same direction. For our gyroscope, the lever arm is approximately the length between the stand and the wheel. And the force from gravity in this orientation would be into your screen. Uh, so we can show that arrow going into the screen with a little circle and a cross like this. There's a similarly strange trick to find the direction of angular momentum. This one is easiest if you curl your fingers in the direction of the rotation using your right hand and your thumb will point in the direction of the angular momentum. You may recall from earlier we used L to represent the angular momentum. Now let's bring both of those things together. So we get the direction of angular momentum out of the gyroscope, like so, and the same direction as the lever arm, and then the force of gravity is pulling it down or into your screen. So that gives us the torque, and it's to the left. So that's the same direction as the change in angular momentum with respect to time, according to that last equation we looked at. So the red angular momentum vector will always be changing to the left. Now let's say we spun the gyro wheel the opposite way. Well, for this orientation, the torque isn't changing but the initial angular momentum is. So if you're thinking about it from the perspective of that angular momentum vector, it's now changing to the right. Precession pops up all over the place. The Earth exhibits axial precession over the course of about 26,000 years. It occurs in electromagnetism, one of my favorite examples is apsidal precession, where orbits follow these interesting flower petal shapes over time. This is mostly caused by external gravitational influences in the solar system. A big factor is the massive planet Jupiter. The precession of Mercury's orbit actually had some mysteries for a while, until Einstein's theory of general relativity, because Mercury is much closer to the Sun, it experiences more slowing of time, and that caused some differences in its precession. So to cap things off, there are actually some similarities between the physical behavior of these massive planets experiencing time dilation due to curvature of space-time, and a tiny little toy gyroscope that I bought after a short conversation I had while handing in some graded physics quizzes.